Act Three of The Second Mrs. Tanqueray by Arthur Wing Pinero. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Third Act The Drawing Room at Hyacombe. Facing the spectator are two large French windows, sheltered by a veranda leading into the garden. On the right is a door opening into a small hall. The fireplace, with a large mirror above it, is on the left-hand side of the room, and higher up in the same wall are double doors recessed. The room is richly furnished, and everything betokens taste and luxury. The windows are open, and there is moonlight in the garden. Lady Oriet a pretty affected doll of a woman with a mincing voice and flaxen hair is sitting on the ottoman her head resting against the drum and her eyes closed paula looking pale worn and thoroughly unhappy is sitting at a table both are in sumptuous dinner gowns lady oriet opening her eyes well i never i dropped off feeling her hair just fancy where are the men paula icily outside smoking a servant enters with coffee which he hands to lady oriet sir george oriet comes in by the window he is a man of about thirty-five with a low forehead a receding chin a vacuous expression and an ominous redness about the nose lady oriet taking coffee here's dodo i say the flies under the veranda make you swear the servant hands coffee to paula who declines it then to sir george who takes a cup ay wait a bit he looks at the tray searchingly then puts back his cup never mind quietly to lady oriet i say they're do sparing with their liquor ain't they the servant goes out at window paula to sir george won't you take coffee george no thanks it's getting near time for a whisky and potash approaching paula regarding lady oriet admiringly i say Birdie looks ripping tonight, don't she? Your wife? Yes, Birdie. Ripping? Yes. Quite, quite ripping. He moves round to the settee. Paula watches him with distaste, then rises and walks away. Sir George falls asleep on the settee. Paula, love i fancied you and aubrey were a little more friendly at dinner you haven't made it up have you we oh no we speak before others that's all and how long do you intend to carry on this game dear paula turning away impatiently i really can't tell you sit down old girl don't be so fidgety paula sits on the upper seat of the ottoman with her back to lady oriet of course it's my duty as an old friend to give you a good talking to paula glares at her suddenly and fiercely but really i've found one gets so many smacks in the face through interfering in matrimonial squabbles that i've determined to drop it i think you're wise however i must say that i do wish you'd look at marriage in a more solemn light just as i do in fact it is such a beautiful thing marriage and if people in our position don't respect it and set a good example by living happily with their husbands what can you expect from the middle classes when did this sad state of affairs between you and aubrey actually begin actually a fortnight and three days ago i haven't calculated the minutes a day or two before dodo and i turned up arrived yes one always remembers one thing by another we left off speaking to each other the morning i wrote asking you to visit us 
Lucky for you I was able to pop down, wasn't it, dear? Paula, glaring at her again. Most fortunate. A serious split with your husband without a pal on the premises. I should say without a friend in the house would be most unpleasant. Paula, turning to her abruptly. This place must be horribly doleful for you and George just now. At least, you ought to consider him before me. Why don't you leave me to my difficulties? Oh, we're quite comfortable, dear. Thank you, both of us. George and me are so wrapped up in each other, it doesn't matter where we are. I don't want to crow over you, old girl, but I've got a perfect husband. Sir George is now fast asleep, his head thrown back and his mouth open, looking hideous. Paula, glancing at Sir George. So you've given me to understand. Not that we don't have our little differences. Why, we fell out only this very morning. You remember the diamond and ruby tiara Charlie Prestwick gave poor dear Connie Tirlemont years ago, don't you? No, I do not. No? Well, it's in the market. Benjamin of Piccadilly has got it in his shop window, and I've set my heart on it. You consider it quite necessary? Yes, because what I say to Dodo is this. A lady of my station must smother herself with hair ornaments. It's different with you, love. People don't look for so much blaze from you. But I've got rank to keep up, haven't I? Yes. Well, that was the cause of the little set-to between I and Dodo this morning. He broke two chairs. He was in such a rage. I forgot. They're your chairs. Do you mind? No. You know, poor Dodo can't lose his temper without smashing something. If it isn't a chair, it's a mirror. If it isn't that, it's china. A bit of Dresden for choice. Dear old pet. He loves a bit of Dresden when he's furious. He doesn't really throw things at me, dear. He simply lifts them up and drops them, like a gentleman. I expect our room upstairs will look rather wrecky before I get that tiara. Excuse the suggestion. Perhaps your husband can't afford it. Oh, how dreadfully changed you are, Paula. Dodo can always mortgage something or borrow off his ma. What is coming to you? Ah. <sighs> She sits at the piano and touches the keys. Oh, yes, do play. That's the one thing I envy you for. What shall I play? What was that heavenly piece you gave us last night, dear? A bit of Schubert. Would you like to hear it again? You don't know any comic songs, do you? I'm afraid not. I leave it to you, then. Paula plays. Aubrey and Kaylee Drummle appear outside the window. They look into the room. Aubrey to Drummle. You can see her face in that mirror. Poor girl, how ill and wretched she looks. When are the Oriots going? Heaven knows. Entering the room. But you're entertaining them. What's it to do with heaven? Following Aubrey. Do you know, Kaylee, that even the Oriots serve a useful purpose? My wife actually speaks to me before our guests. Think of that. I've come to rejoice at the presence of the Oriads. I dare say. We're taught that beetles are sent for a benign end. Kaylee, talk to Paula again tonight. Certainly, if I get the chance. Let's contrive it. George is asleep. Perhaps I can get that doll out of the way. As they advance into the room, Paula abruptly ceases playing and finds interest in a volume of music. Sir George is now nodding and snoring apoplectically. Lady Oread, whenever you feel inclined for a game of billiards, I'm at your service. Lady Oread, jumping up. Charmed, I'm sure. I really thought you'd forgotten poor little me. Oh, look at Dodo. No, no, don't wake him. He's tired. I must. He looks so plain. Rousing Sir George. Dodo, 
Dodo. Hello? Dodo, dear, you were snoring. Oh, I see. You could have told me that by and by. You want a cigar, George? Come into the billiard room. Giving his arm to Lady Oriet. Kaylee, bring Paula. Aubrey and Lady Oriet go out. Sir George, rising. Hey, what? Billiard room. Looking at his watch. How goes the... Oh. Hello, hello. Whiskey and potass. He goes rapidly after Aubrey and Lady Oriet. Paula resumes playing. Paula, after a pause. Don't moon about after me, Cayley. Follow the others. Thanks, by and by. Sitting. That's pretty. Paula, after another pause, still playing. I wish you wouldn't stare so. Was I staring? I'm sorry. She plays a little longer, then stops suddenly, rises and goes to the window, where she stands looking out. Drummle moves from the ottoman to the settee. A lovely night. Paula, startled. Ah! Without turning to him. Why do you hop about like a monkey? Hot rooms play the deuce for the nerves. Now, it would have done you good to have walked in the garden with us after dinner and made merry. Why didn't you? You know why. Ah, you're thinking of the difference between you and Aubrey. Yes, I am thinking of it. Well, so am I. How long? Getting on for three weeks. Bless me. It must be. And this would have been such a night to have healed it. Moonlight, the stars, the scent of flowers, and yet enough darkness to enable a kind woman to rest her hand for an instant on the arm of a good fellow who loves her. Ah, it's a wonderful power, dear Mrs. Aubrey, the power of an offended woman. Only realize it. Just that one touch. The mere tips of her fingers. And, for herself and another, she changes the color of the whole world. Paula, turning to him calmly. Cayley, my dear man, you talk exactly like a very romantic old lady. She leaves the window and sits playing with the knick-knacks on the table. Drummel to himself. <sighs> that hasn't done it. Well... <laughs> I accept the suggestion. An old woman, eh? Oh, I didn't intend. But why not? I have every qualification. Well, almost. And I confess it would have given this withered bosom a throb of grandmotherly satisfaction if I could have seen you and Aubrey at peace before I take my leave tomorrow. Tomorrow, Cayley? I must. Oh, this house is becoming unendurable. You're very kind. But you've got the Oreads. Paula, fiercely. The Oreads? I hate the Oreads. I lie awake at night, hating them. Pardon me. I've understood that their visit is, in some degree, owing to... <clears throat> your suggestion. Heavens! That doesn't make me like them better. Somehow or another, I... I've outgrown these people. This woman... I used to think her jolly. Sickens me. I can't breathe when she's near me. The whiff of her handkerchief turns me faint. And she patronises me by the hour, until I... I feel my nails growing longer with every word she speaks. My dear lady, why on earth don't you say all this to Aubrey? Oh, I've been such an utter fool, Cayley. Drummle soothingly. Well, well, mention it to Aubrey. No, no, you don't understand. What do you think I've done? Done? What? Since you invite the Oriots? Yes, I must tell you. Perhaps you'd better not. Look here. I've intercepted some letters from Mrs. Cortelion and Aline to him. Producing three unopened letters from the bodice of her dress. There are the accursed things. 
from Paris, two from the Cotillon woman, the other from Aline. But why? Why? Oh, I don't know. Yes, I do. I saw letters coming from Aline to her father. Not a line to me, not a line. And one morning it happened I was downstairs before he was, and I spied this one lying with his heap on the breakfast table, and I slipped it into my pocket, out of malice, Cayley, pure devilry. And a day or two afterwards I met Yules, the postman at the lodge, and took the letters from him, and found these others amongst them. I felt simply fiendish when I saw them, fiendish. Returning the letters to her bodice. And now I carry them about with me, and they're scorching me like a mustard plaster. Oh, this accounts for Aubrey not hearing from Paris lately. That's an ingenious conclusion to arrive at. Of course it does. <laughs> well, well. <laughs> Paula turning upon him. I suppose it is amusing. I beg pardon. Heaven knows I've little enough to brag about. I'm a bad lot, but not in mean tricks of this sort. In all my life, this is the most caddish thing I've done. How am I to get rid of these letters? That's what I want to know. How am I to get rid of them? If I were you, I should take Aubrey aside and put them into his hands as soon as possible. What? And tell him to his face that I... No, thank you. I suppose you wouldn't like to... No, no, I won't touch them. And you call yourself my friend? Drummle good-humouredly. No, I don't. Perhaps I'll tie them together and give them to his man in the morning. That won't avoid an explanation. Paula, recklessly. Oh, then he must miss them. And trace them. Paula, throwing herself upon the ottoman. I don't care. I know you don't. But let me send him to you now, may I? Now? What do you think a woman's made of? I couldn't stand it, Cayley. I haven't slept for nights. And last night there was thunder, too. I believe I've got the horrors. Drummle, taking the little hand mirror from the table. You'll sleep well enough when you deliver those letters. Come, come, Mrs. Aubrey. A good night's rest. Holding the mirror before her face. It's quite time. She looks at herself for a moment, then snatches the mirror from him. You brute, Cayley, to show me that. Then may I be guided by a, fr a poor old woman? May I? You'll kill me amongst you. What do you say? Paula, after a pause. Very well. He nods his head and goes out rapidly. She looks after him for a moment and calls Cayley, Cayley. Then she again produces the letters, deliberately, one by one, fingering them with aversion. Suddenly she starts, turning her head towards the door. Ah! Aubrey enters quickly. Paula? Paula, handing him the letters, her face averted. There. He examines the letters, puzzled, and looks at her inquiringly. They are many days old. I stole them. I suppose to make you anxious and unhappy. He looks at the letters again, then lays them aside on the table. Aubrey, gently. Paula, dear, it doesn't matter. Paula, after a short pause. Why? Why do you take it like this? What did you expect? Oh, but I suppose silent reproaches are really the severest. And then, naturally, you are itching to open your letters. She crosses the room as if to go. Paula! She pauses. Surely, surely it's all over now. All over? Has my stepdaughter returned then? When did she arrive? I haven't heard of it. You can be very cruel. That word is always on a man's lips. He uses it if his soup's cold. With another movement as if to go. Need we? I know I've wounded you, Paula. But isn't there any way out of this? When does Aline return? Tomorrow? Next week? Oh, why should we grudge Aline the little pleasure she is likely to find in Paris and in London? I grudge her nothing, if that's a hit at me. But with that woman... It must be that woman or another. 
you know that at present we are unable to give Aline the opportunity of 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 mixing with respectable people the opportunity of gaining friends experience ordinary knowledge of the world if you are interested in Aline can't you see how useful Mrs. Cordelion's good offices are? May I put one question? At the end of the London season, when Mrs. Cordelion has done with Aline, is it quite understood that the girl comes back to us? Aubrey is silent. Is it? Is it? Let us wait till the end of the season. Ah, oh, I knew it. You are only fooling me. You put me off with any trash. I believe you've sent Aline away, not for the reasons you give, but because you don't consider me a decent companion for her, because you're afraid she might get a little of her innocence rubbed off in my company. Come, isn't that the truth? Be honest. Isn't that it? Yes. There is a moment's silence on both sides. Paula, with uplifted hands as if to strike him. Oh! Aubrey, taking her by the wrists. Sit down sit down he puts her into a chair she shakes herself free with a cry now listen to me fond as you are paula of harking back to your past there's one chapter of it you always let alone i've never asked you to speak of it you've never offered to speak of it i mean the chapter that relates to the time when you were like Eline. she attempts to rise he restrains her no no I don't choose to talk about that time. I won't satisfy your curiosity. My dear Paula, I have no curiosity. I know what you were at Aline's age. I'll tell you. You hadn't a thought that wasn't a wholesome one. You hadn't an impulse that didn't tend towards good. You never harbored a notion you couldn't have gossiped about to a parcel of children. She makes another effort to rise. He lays his hand lightly on her shoulder. And this was a very few years back. There are days now when you look like a schoolgirl. But think of the difference between the two Paulas. You'll have to think hard, because after a cruel life one's perceptions grow a thick skin. But for God's sakes, do think till you get these two images clearly in your mind, and then ask yourself what sort of a friend such a woman as you are today would have been for the girl of seven or eight years ago. Paula, rising. How dare you! I could be almost as good a friend to Aline as her own mother would have been had she lived. I know what you mean. How dare you! You say that. Very likely you believe it. But you're blind, Paula, you're blind. You, every belief that a young, pure-minded girl holds sacred, that you once held sacred, you now make a target for a jest, a sneer, a paltry cynicism. I tell you, you're not mistress any longer of your thoughts or your tongue. Why, how often, sitting between you and Aline, have I seen her cheeks turn scarlet as you've rattled off some tale that belongs by right to the club or the smoking room? Have you noticed the blush? If you have, has the cause of it ever struck you? And this is the girl you say you love? I admit that you do love, whose love you expect in return. Oh, Paula, I make the best, the only excuse for you when I tell you you're blind. Aline, Aline blushes easily. You blushed as easily a few years ago. Well, have you finished your sermon? Aubrey, with a gesture of despair. Oh, Paula. Going up to the window and standing with his back to the room. Paula to herself. A few years ago she walks slowly towards the door then suddenly drops upon the ottoman in a paroxysm of weeping oh god a few years ago aubrey going to her paula don't touch me paula oh go away from me he goes back a few steps and after a little while she becomes calmer and rises unsteadily then in an altered tone look here he advances a step she checks him with a quick gesture look here get rid of these people mabel and her husband as soon as possible i've done with them paula and then 
then when the time comes for Aline to leave mrs cortelion give me give me another chance he advances again but she shrinks away no no she goes out by the door on the right he sinks on to the settee covering his eyes with his hands there is a brief silence then a servant enters mrs cortelion sir with miss Aline. aubrey rises to meet mrs cortelion who enters followed by Aline, both being in travelling dresses the servant withdraws mrs cortelion shaking hands with aubrey oh my dear aubrey mrs cortelion kissing Aline. Aline, dear papa is all well at home we're shockingly anxious yes yes all's well this is quite unexpected to mrs cortelion you found paris insufferably hot insufferably hot paris is pleasant enough we've had no letter from you i wrote to Aline a week ago without alluding to the subject i had written to you upon aubrey thinking ah of course and since then we've both written and you've been absolutely silent oh it's too bad aubrey picking up the letters from the table it isn't altogether my fault here are the letters papa they're unopened an accident delayed their reaching me till this evening i'm afraid this has upset you very much upset me Aline in an undertone to mrs cortelion never mind not now dear not to-night eh mrs cortelion to Aline aloud child run away and take your things off <sighs> she doesn't look as if she journeyed from paris to-day i've never seen her with such a colour taking Aline's hands Aline to aubrey in a faint voice papa mrs cortelion has been so very very kind to me but i i have come home she goes out come home to mrs cortelion Aline returns to us then that's the very point i put to you in my letters and you oblige me to travel from paris to willowmere on a warm day to settle it i think perhaps it's right that Aline should be with you just now although i my dear friend circumstances are a little altered alice you're in some trouble well yes i am in trouble you remember pretty little mrs brereton who was once caroline ardale quite well she's a widow now poor thing she has the entresol of the house where we've been lodging in the avenue de friedland caroline's a dear chum of mine she formed a great liking for Aline. i'm very glad yes it's nice for her to meet her mother's friends er uh, that young you ardale the papers were full of some time ago he's caroline brereton's brother you know no i didn't know what did he do i forget checked one of those horrid mutinies at some faraway station in india marched down with a handful of his men and a few faithful natives and held the place until he was relieved they gave him his company and a v c for it and he's mrs brereton's brother yes he's with his sister was rather in paris he's home invalided good gracious aubrey why don't you help me out can't you guess what has occurred alice young ardale Aline. an attachment yes aubrey well i suppose i've got myself into sad disgrace but really i didn't foresee anything of this kind a serious reserved child like Aline, and a boyish high-spirited soldier it never struck me as being likely aubrey paces to and fro thoughtfully i did all i could directly captain ardale spoke wrote to you at once why on earth didn't you receive your letters promptly and when you do get them why can't you open them 
i endured the anxiety till last night and then made up my mind home of course it has worried me terribly my head's bursting <sighs> are there any salts about aubrey fetches a bottle from the cabinet and hands it to her we've had one of those hateful smooth crossings that won't let you be properly indisposed my dear alice i assure you i've no thought of blaming you that statement always precedes a quarrel i don't know whether this is the worst or the best luck how will my wife regard it is captain ardale a good fellow my dear aubrey you'd better read up the accounts of his wonderful heroism face to face with death for a whole week always with a smile and a cheering word for the poor helpless souls depending on him of course it's that that has stirred the depths of your child's nature i've watched her while we've been dragging the story out of him and if angels look different from aline at that moment i don't desire to meet any that's all if you were in my position but you can't judge why if i had a marriageable daughter of my own and captain ardale proposed for her naturally i should cry my eyes out all night but i should thank heaven in the morning you believe so thoroughly in him do you think i should have only a headache at this minute if i didn't look here you've got to see me down the lane that's the least you can do my friend come into my house for a moment and shake hands with you what is he here he came through with us to present himself formally to-morrow where are my gloves aubrey fetches them from the ottoman make my apologies to mrs tankery please she is well i hope going towards the door i can't feel sorry she hasn't seen me in this condition aline enters aline to mrs cortellian i've been waiting to wish you good night i was afraid i'd missed you good night aline aline in a low voice embracing mrs cortellian i can't thank you dear mrs cortellian mrs cortellian her arms round aline in a whisper to aubrey speak a word to her mrs cortellian goes out aubrey to aline aline i'm going to see mrs corleone home tell paula where i am explain dear going to the door aline her head drooping yes father you are angry with me disappointed angry no disappointed aubrey smiling and going to her and taking her hand if so it's only because you've shaken my belief in my discernment i thought you took after your poor mother a little aline but there's a look on your face to-night dear that i never saw on hers never never aline leaning her head on his shoulder perhaps i ought not to have gone away hush you're quite happy yes that's right then as you are quite happy there is something i particularly want you to do for me aline what is that be very gentle with paula will you you think i've been unkind aubrey kissing her upon the forehead be very gentle with paula he goes out and she stands looking after him then as she turns thoughtfully from the door a rose is thrown through the window and falls at her feet she picks up the flower wonderingly and goes to the window aline starting back hugh hugh ardale a handsome young man of about seven-and-twenty with a boyish face and manner appears outside the window nelly nelly dear what's the matter hush nothing it's only fun <laughs> i've found out that mrs cortleon's meadow runs up to your father's plantation i've come through a gap in the hedge why you i'm miserable at the warren it's so different from the avenue de friedland don't look like that upon my word i meant just to peep at your home and go back but i saw figures moving about here and came nearer hoping to get a glimpse of you was that your father entering the room yes isn't this fun 
A rabbit ran across my foot while I was hiding behind that old yew. You must go away. It's not right for you to be here like this. But it's only fun, I tell you. You take everything so seriously. Do wish me good night. We have said good night. In the hall at the Warren before Mrs. Cortleon and a manservant. Oh, it's so different from the Avenue de Friedland. Aline, giving him her hand hastily. Good night, Hugh. Is that all? We might be the merest acquaintances. He momentarily embraces her, but she releases herself. It's when you're like this that you make me feel utterly miserable. Throwing the rose from her angrily. Oh! I've offended you now, I suppose. Yes. Forgive me, Nelly. Come into the garden for five minutes. We'll stroll down to the plantation. No, no. For two minutes. To tell me you forgive me. I forgive you. Evidently. I shan't sleep a wink tonight after this. What a fool am I. Come down to the plantation. Make it up with me. There is somebody coming into this room. Do you wish to be seen here? I shall wait for you behind that yew tree. You must speak to me, Nelly. He disappears. Paula enters. Elaine! You... you are very surprised to see me, Paula, of course. Why are you here? Why aren't you with... your friend? I've come home, if you'll have me. We left Paris this morning. Mrs. Cortellian brought me back. She was here a minute or two ago. Papa has just gone with her to the Warren. He asked me to tell you. There are some people staying with us that I'd rather you didn't meet. It was hardly worth your while to return for a few hours. A few hours? Well, when do you go to London? I don't think I go to London, after all. Paula, eagerly. You, you've quarrelled with her? No, 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 not that, but Paula, Paula. Huh? Aline goes deliberately to Paula and kisses her. Aline? Kiss me. What? What's come to you? I want to behave differently to you in the future. Is it too late? Too late? Impulsively kissing Aline and crying. No, 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 no. Paula, don't cry. Paula, wiping her eyes. I'm a little shaky. I haven't been sleeping. It's all right. Talk to me. There is something I want to tell you. Is there? Is there? They sit together on the ottoman, Paula taking Aline's hand. Paula, in our house in the Avenue de Friedland, on the floor below us, there was a Mrs. Brereton. She used to be a friend of my mother's. Mrs. Cortellian and I spent a great deal of our time with her. Paula suspiciously. Oh! Letting Aline's hand fall. Is this lady going to take you up in place of Mrs. Cortellian? No, no. Her brother is staying with her. Was staying with her. Her brother... Breaking off in confusion. Well? Paula? She rises and walks away. Paula following her. Aline? Taking hold of her. You're not in love? Aline looks at Paula appealingly. Oh, you in love. You. Oh, this is why you've come home. Of course you can make friends with me now. You'll leave us for good soon, I suppose. So it doesn't much matter being civil to me for a little while. Oh, Paula. Why, how you've deceived us, all of us. We've taken you for a cold-blooded little saint. The fools you've made of us. Saint Aline, Saint Aline. Oh, I might have known you'd only mock me. Paula, her tone changing. Eh? I... I can't talk to you. Sitting on the settee. You do nothing else but mock and sneer. Nothing else. Elaine, dear. Elaine, I didn't mean it. I'm so horribly jealous. It's a sort of curse on me. Kneeling beside Elaine and embracing her. My tongue runs away with me. I'm going to alter. I swear I am. I've made some good resolutions. And as God's above me, I'll keep them. If you are in love, if you do ever marry, there's no reason why we shouldn't be fond of each other. Come, you've kissed me of your own accord, you can't take it back. Now we're friends again, aren't we, Aline, dear? I want to know everything, 
everything, Elaine, dear, Elaine. Paula, Hugh has done something that makes me very angry. He came with us from Paris today to see Papa. He is staying with Mrs. Cortellian, and I ought to tell you. Yes, yes. What? He has found his way by the Warren Meadow, through the plantation up to this house. He is waiting to bid me good night. Glancing towards the garden. He is out there. Oh. What shall I do? Bring him in to see me, will you? No, no. But I'm dying to know him. Oh, yes, you must. I shall meet him before Aubrey does. Excitedly running her hands over her hair. I'm so glad. Aline goes out by the window. The mirror! Mirror! Oh, what a fright I must look! Not finding the hand-glass on the table, she jumps onto the settee and surveys herself in the mirror over the mantelpiece, then sits quietly down and waits. Aline! Just fancy! Aline! After a pause, Aline enters by the window with Hugh. Paula, this is Captain Ardale. Mrs. Tanqueray. Paula rises and turns, and she and Hugh stand staring blankly at each other for a moment or two. Then Paula advances and gives him her hand. Paula, in a strange voice, but calmly, How do you do? How do you do? Paula to Aline. Mr. Ardale and I have met in London, Aline. Uh, Captain Ardale now? Yes. In London? They say the world's very small, don't they? Yes. Elaine, dear, I want to have a little talk about you to Mr. Ardale. Captain Ardale, alone. Putting her arms around Elaine and leading her to the door. Come back in a little while. Elaine nods to Paula with a smile and goes out, while Paula stands watching her at the open door. In a little while. In a little closing the door and then taking a seat facing Hugh. Be quick! Mr. Tanqueray has only gone down to the Warren with Mrs. Cortellion. What is to be done? Done? Done! Done! Something must be done! I understood that Mr. Tanqueray had married a Mrs. Mrs. Jarman? Yes. I'd been going by that name. You didn't follow my doings after we separated. No. Paula, sneeringly. No. I went out to India. What's to be done? Damn this chance. Oh, my God. Your husband doesn't know, does he? That you and I... Yes. No. He knows about the others. Not about me. How long were we... I don't remember exactly. Do you... Uh, do you think it matters? His... His daughter! Oh! With a muttered exclamation, he turns away and sits with his head in his hands. What's to be done? I wish I could think. Oh, oh, what happened to that flat of ours in Ethelbert Street? I let it. All the pretty furniture? Sold it. I came across the key of the escritoire the other day in an old purse. Suddenly realizing the horror and hopelessness of her position, and starting to her feet with a hysterical cry of rage. What am I maundering about? For God's sake, be quiet. Do let me think. This will send me mad. Suddenly turning and standing over him. You, you beast, to crop up in my life again like this. I always treated you fairly. Paula, weakly. Oh, I beg your pardon. I know you did. I... <laughs> she sinks onto the settee, crying hysterically. Hush. She kissed me tonight. I'd won her over. I've had such a fight to make her love me. And now, just as she's beginning to love me, to bring this on her. Hush, hush, don't break down. Oh, you don't know. I haven't been getting on well in my marriage. It's been my fault. The life I used to lead spoiled me completely. But I'd made up my mind to turn over a new life from tonight. From tonight. Paula. Don't you call me that. 
mrs tanqueray there is no cause for you to despair in this way it's all right i tell you it shall be all right paula shivering what are we to do hold our tongues hey staring vacantly the chances are a hundred to one against any one ever turning up who knew us when we were together besides no one would be such a brute as to split on us if anybody did do such a thing we should have to lie what are we upsetting ourselves like this for when we've simply got to hold our tongues you're as mad as i am can you think of a better plan there's only one plan possible let's come to our senses mr tanqueray must be told your husband what and i lose elian i lose elian you've got to lose her i won't lose her i can't lose her didn't i read of your doing any number of brave things in india why you seem to be an awful coward that's another sort of pluck altogether i haven't this sort of pluck oh i don't ask you to tell mr tanqueray that's my job hugh standing over her you you you'd better you paula rising don't bully me i intend to hugh taking hold of her she wrenches herself free look here paula i never treated you badly you've owned it why should you want to pay me out like this you don't know how i love elian yes that's just what i do know i say you don't she's as good as my own mother i've been downright honest with her too i told her in paris that i'd been a bit wild at one time and after a damned wretched day she promised to forgive me because of what i'd done since in india she's behaved like an angel to me surely i oughtn't to lose her after all just because i've been like other fellows no i haven't been half as rackety as a hundred men we could think of paula don't pay me out for nothing be fair to me there's a good girl be fair to me oh i'm not considering you at all i advise you not to stay here any longer mr tanqueray is sure to be back soon hugh taking up his hat what's the understanding between us then what have we arranged to do i don't know what you're going to do i've got to tell mr tanqueray by god you shall do nothing of the sort approaching her fiercely you shocking coward if you dare going up to the window mind if you dare paula following him why what would you do nothing i'd shoot myself that's nothing good night good night he disappears she walks unsteadily to the ottoman and sits and as she does so her hand falls upon the little silver mirror which she takes up staring at her own reflection end of the third act Act Four of The Second Mrs. Tanqueray by Arthur Wing Pinero. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Fourth Act The Drawing Room at Hyacombe, the same evening. Paula is still seated on the ottoman, looking vacantly before her with the little mirror in her hand. Lady Oread enters. There you are. You never came into the billiard room. Isn't it maddening? Kaylee Drummle gives me sixty out of a hundred and beats me. I must be out of form, because I know I play remarkably well for a lady. Only last month... Paula rises. What? Ever is the matter with you, old girl? Why? Lady Oread, staring. It's the light, I suppose. Paula replaces the mirror on the table. By Aubrey's bolting from the billiard table in that fashion, I thought. Perhaps. Yes, it's all right. You've patched it up? 
Paula nods. Oh, I am jolly glad. I mean... Yes, I know what you mean. Thanks, Mabel. Lady Oriet, kissing Paula. Now take my advice. For the future... Mabel, if I've been disagreeable to you while you've been staying here, I... I beg your pardon. Walking away and sitting down. You disagreeable, my dear? I haven't noticed it. Dodo and me both consider you make a first-class hostess. But then, you've had such practice, haven't you? Dropping on to the ottoman and gaping. Oh, talk about being sleepy. Why don't you? Why, dear, I must hang about for Dodo. You may as well know it. He's in one of his moods. Paula under her breath. Oh. Now it's not his fault. It was deadly dull for him while we were playing billiards. Kaylee Drummle did ask him to mark, but I stopped that. It's so easy to make a gentleman look like a billiard marker. This is just how it always is. If poor old Dodo has nothing to do, he loses count, as you may say. Hark! Sir George Orgett enters, walking slowly and deliberately. He looks pale and watery-eyed. Sir George, with mournful indistinctness. I'm afraid we've left you a great deal to yourself tonight, Mrs. Tankery. Attractions of billiards. I apologise. I say, where's all Aubrey? My husband has been obliged to go out to a neighbour's house. I want his advice on a rather pressing matter connected with my family. My family. Sitting. Tomorrow will do just as well. Lady Oriet to Paula. This is the mood I hate so. Driveling about his precious family. The fact is, Mrs. Tankery, I'm not easy in my mind about the way I am treating my poor old mother. Do you hear that? That's his mother. But my mother he won't so much as look at. I shall write to Bruton Street first thing in the morning. Mama has stuck to me through everything. Well, you know. I'll get all old Bree to figure out a letter. I'll drop a line to Uncle Fitz, too. Do shame with the old fella to chuck me over in this manner. Wiping his eyes. All my family have chucked me over. Lady Oriet rising. Dodo. Just because I married beneath me to be chucked over. Aunt Lydia, the General, Ookie Whitgrave, Lady Signal, my own dear sister, all turn their backs on me. It's more than I can stand. Lady Oriet approaching him with dignity. Sir George, wish Mrs. Tankery good night at once and come upstairs. Do you hear me? Sir George rising angrily what be quiet you presume to order me about you're making an exhibition of yourself look here come along i tell you he hesitates utters a few inarticulate sounds then snatches up a fragile ornament from the table and is about to dash it onto the ground Lady Oriet retreats, and Paula goes to him. George. He replaces the ornament. Sir George, shaking Paula's hand. Good night, Mrs. Tankery. Lady Oriet to Paula. Good night, darling. Wish Aubrey good night for me. Now, Dodo. She goes out. Sir George to Paula. I say... 
Are you going to sit up for all Aubrey? Yes. Shall I keep company? No, thank you, George. Sure? Yes, sure. Sir George, shaking hands. Good night again. Good night. She turns away. He goes out, steadying himself carefully. Drummle appears outside the window, smoking. Drummle, looking into the room and seeing Paula. My last cigar. Where is Aubrey? Gone down to the Warren, to see Mrs. Cortillon home. Drummle, entering the room. Eh? Did you say Mrs. Cortillon? Yes. She has brought Elaine back. Bless my soul. Why? Oh, I'm too tired to tell you, Cayley. If you stroll along the lane, you'll meet Aubrey. Get the news from him. Drummle, going up to the window. Yes, yes. Returning to Paula. I don't want to bother you, only... The anxious old woman, you know. Are you and Aubrey... Good friends again? Drummle, nodding. Hmm. Paula, giving him her hand. Quite, Cayley, quite. Drummle, retaining her hand. That's capital. As I'm off so early tomorrow morning, let me say now. Thank you for your hospitality. He bends over her hand gallantly, then goes out by the window. Paula, to herself. Are you and Aubrey? Good friends again? Yes. Quite, Cayley. Quite. There is a brief pause. Then Aubrey enters hurriedly, wearing a light overcoat and carrying a cap. Paula, dear, have you seen Aline? I found her here when I came down. She... she's told you? Yes, Aubrey. It's extraordinary, isn't it? Not that somebody should fall in love with Aline, or that Aline herself should fall in love. All that's natural enough, and was bound to happen, I suppose, sooner or later. But this young fellow, you know his history? His history? You remember the papers were full of his name a few months ago? Oh, yes. The man's as brave as a lion, there's no doubt about that. And at the same time, he's like a big, good-natured schoolboy, Mrs. Cordelion says. Have you ever pictured the kind of man Aline would marry some day? I can't say that I have. A grave, sedate fellow, I've thought about. Ah! She has fallen in love with the way in which Ardale practically laid down his life to save those poor people shut up in the residency. Taking off his coat. Well, I suppose if a man can do that sort of a thing, one ought to be content. And yet... Throwing his coat on the settee. I should have met him tonight, but he'd gone out. Paula, dear, tell me how you look upon this business. Yes, I will. I must. To begin with, I... I've seen Mr. Ardale. Captain Ardale? Captain Ardale. Seen him? While you were away, he came up here, through our grounds, to try to get a word with Aline. I made her fetch him in and present him to me. Aubrey, frowning. Doesn't Captain Ardale know there's a lodge and a front door to this place? Never mind. What is your impression of him? Aubrey, do you recollect my bringing you a letter? A letter giving you an account of myself? To the Albany, late one night. The night before we got married? A letter? You burnt it, don't you know? Yes, I know. His name was in that letter. Aubrey, going back from her slowly and staring at her. I don't understand. Well, Ardale and I once kept house together. He remains silent, not moving. Why don't you strike me? Hit me in the face. I'd rather you did. Hurt me. Hurt me. Aubrey, after a pause. What did... What did you and this man say to each other just now? I hardly know. Think. The end of it all was that I... I told him I must inform you of what had happened. He didn't want me to do that. I declared that I would. He dared me to. 
Oh, let me alone. <laughs> Where was my daughter while this went on? I, I had sent her out of the room. That is all right. Yes, 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 yes. He turns his head towards the door. Who's that? A servant enters with a letter. The coachman has just run up with this from the warren, sir. Aubrey takes the letter. It's for Mrs. Tanqueray, sir. There's no answer. The servant withdraws. Aubrey goes to Paula and drops the letter into her lap. She opens it with uncertain hands. Paula, reading it to herself. It's from him. He's going away, or gone, I think. Rising in a weak way. What does it say? I never could make out his writing. She gives the letter to Aubrey and stands near him, looking at the letter over his shoulder as he reads. Aubrey, reading. I shall be in Paris by tomorrow evening. Shall wait there at Maurice's for a week, ready to receive any communication you or your husband may address to me. Please invent some explanation to Aileen. Mrs. Tangeray, for God's sake, do what you can for me. Paula and Aubrey speak in low voices, both still looking at the letter. Has he left the warren, I wonder, already? That doesn't matter. No, but I can picture him going quietly off. Very likely he's walking on to Bridgeford or Cottering tonight, to get the first train in the morning. A pleasant stroll for him. We'll reckon he's gone. That's enough. That isn't to be answered in any way? Silence will answer that. He'll soon recover his spirits, I know. You know. Offering her the letter. You don't want this, I suppose. No. It's done with. Done with. He tears the letter into small pieces. She has dropped the envelope. She searches for it, finds it, and gives it to him. Here. Aubrey, looking at the remnants of the letter. This is no good. I must burn it. Burn it in your room. Yes. Put it in your pocket for now. Yes. He does so. Aline enters and they both turn, guiltily, and stare at her. Aline, after a short silence, wonderingly. Papa? What do you want, Aline? I heard from Willis that you had come in. I only want to wish you good night. Paula steals away without looking back. What's the matter? Ah, oh, of course. Paula has told you about Captain Armadale. Well? Have you and he met? No. You are angry with him. So was I. But tomorrow, when he calls and expresses his regret, tomorrow... Aline, Aline. Yes, Papa? I, I can't let you see this man again. He walks away from her in a paroxysm of distress. Then, after a moment or two, he returns to her and takes her into his arms. Aline, my child! Aline, releasing herself. What has happened, Papa? What is it? Aubrey, thinking out his words deliberately. Something has occurred. Something has come, to my knowledge, in relation to Captain Ardale, which puts any further acquaintanceship between you two out of the question. Any further acquaintanceship? Out of the question? Yes. Advancing to her quickly, but she shrinks from him. No, no, I'm quite well. After a short pause. It's not an hour ago since Mrs. Cortellian left you and me together here. You had nothing to urge against Captain Ardale, then? No. You don't know each other. You haven't even seen him this evening. Father... I have told you he and I have not met. Mrs. Cortellian couldn't have spoken against him to you just now. No, no, no. She's too good a friend to both of us. Aren't you going to give me some explanation? You can't take this position towards me, towards Captain Ardale, without affording me the fullest explanation. Aline, there are circumstances connected with Captain Ardale's career which you had better remain ignorant of. It must be sufficient for you that I consider these circumstances render him unfit to be your husband. Father! You must trust me, Aline. 
you must try to understand the depth of my love for you, and the, the agony it gives me to hurt you. You must trust me. I will, father, but you must trust me a little, too. Circumstances connected with Captain Ardell's career. Yes. When he presents himself here tomorrow, of course you will see him and let him defend himself. Captain Ardell will not be here tomorrow. Not? You have stopped his coming here. Indirectly, yes. But just now, he was talking to me at that window. Nothing had taken place then, and since then nothing can have... Oh, you have heard something against him from Paula. From Paula? She knows him. She has told you so? When I introduced Captain Ardell to her, she said she had met him in London. Of course, it is Paula who has done this. Aubrey, in a hard voice. I, I hope you, you'll refrain from rushing at conclusions. There's nothing to be gained by trying to avoid the main point, which is that you must drive Captain Ardale out of your thoughts. Understand that. You're able to obtain comfort from your religion, aren't you? I'm glad to think that's so. I talk to you in a harsh way, Aline, but I feel your pain almost as acutely as you do. Going to the door. I, I can't say anything more to you tonight. Father. He pauses at the door. Father. I'm obliged to ask you this. There's no help for it. I've no mother to go to. Does what you have heard about Captain Ardell concern the time when he led a wild, a dissolute life in London? Aubrey, returning to her slowly and staring at her. Explain yourself. He has been quite honest with me. One day, in Paris, he confessed to me what a man's life is, what his life had been. Oh. He offered to go away. Not to approach me again. And you? You accepted his view of what a man's life is? As far as I could forgive him, I forgave him. Why wasn't you left us? It hasn't taken you long to get your robe just a little dusty at the hem. What do you mean? Ha! A few weeks ago my one great desire was to keep you ignorant of evil. Father... It is impossible to be ignorant of evil. Instinct, common instinct, teaches us what is good and bad. Surely I am none the worse for knowing what is wicked and detesting it. Detesting it? Why, you love this fellow. Oh, you don't understand. I have simply judged Captain Ardell, as we all pray to be judged. I have lived in imagination through that one week in India, when he deliberately offered his life back to God to save those wretched, desperate people. In his whole career, I see now nothing but that one week. Those few hours bring him nearer the saints, I believe, than fifty uneventful years of mere blamelessness would have done. And so, father, if Paula has reported anything to Captain Ardell's discredit... Paula! It must be Paula. It can't be anybody else. You... you'll please keep Paula out of the question. Finally, Aline, understand me. I have made up my mind. Again going to the door. But wait, listen. I have made up my mind also. Ah, I recognize your mother in you now. You need not speak against my mother because you are angry with me. I I hardly know what I'm saying to you. In the morning, in the morning. He goes out. She remains standing and turns her head to listen. Then, after a moment's hesitation, she goes softly to the window and looks out under the veranda. Aline, in a whisper. Paula! Paula! Paula appears outside the window and steps into the room. Her face is white and drawn, her hair is a little disordered. Paula, huskily. Well? Have you been under the veranda all the while, listening? No. You have overheard us. I see you have. And it is you who have been speaking to my father against Captain Ardale. Isn't it? Paula, why don't you own it or deny it? Oh, I don't mind owning it. Why should I? Oh, you seem to have been very, very eager to tell your tale. No, I wasn't eager, Aline. I'd have given something not to have had to do it. 
I wasn't eager. Not? Oh, I think you might safely have spared us all for a little while. But, Elaine, you forget. I... I am your stepmother. It was my... my duty to tell your father what I... what I knew. What you knew? Why, after all, what can you know? You can only speak from gossip, report, hearsay. How is it possible that you... She stops abruptly. The two women stand staring at each other for a moment. Then Aline backs away from Paula slowly. Paula? What? What's the matter? You... you knew Captain Ardell in London. Why? What do you mean? Oh! She makes for the door, but Paula catches her by the wrist. You shall tell me what you mean. Oh! Suddenly looking fixedly in Paula's face. You know what I mean. You accuse me? It's in your face! Paula, hoarsely. You... you think I'm that sort of creature, do you? Let me go! Answer me. You've always hated me. Shaking her. Out with it! You hurt me. You've always hated me. You shall answer me. Well then, I've always, always... What? I've always known what you were. Oh, who, who told you? Nobody but yourself. From the first moment I saw you, I knew you were altogether unlike the good women I'd left. Directly I saw you, I knew what my father had done. You've wondered why I've turned from you. There, that's the reason. Oh, but this is a horrible way for the truth to come home to everyone. Oh! It's a lie! It's all a lie! Forcing Aline down upon her knees. You shall beg my pardon for it! Aline utters a loud shriek of terror. Aline, I'm a good woman. I swear I am. I've always been a good woman. You dare to say that I've ever been anything else. It's a lie! Throwing her off violently. Aubrey re-enters. Paula! Paula staggers back as Aubrey advances, raising Aline. What's this? What's this? Nothing. It, it's my fault. Father, I, I don't wish to see Captain Ardale again. She goes out, Aubrey slowly following her to the door. Aubrey, she, she guesses guesses about me and ardale about you and ardale she says she suspected my character from the beginning that's why she always kept me at a distance and now she sees through she falters he helps her to the ottoman where she sits aubrey bending over her paula you must have said something admitted something I don't think so. It's... it's in my face. What? She tells me so. She's right. I'm tainted through and through. Anybody can see it. Anybody can find it out. You said much the same to me tonight. If she has got this idea into her head, we must drive it out, that's all. We must take steps to... What shall we do? We had better... better... What... What? Sitting and staring before him. Elaine, so meek, so demure. You've often said she reminded you of her mother. Yes, I know now what your first marriage was like. Oh, we must drive this idea out of her head. We'll do something. What shall we do? She's a regular woman, too. She could forgive him easily enough. But me, that's just a woman. What can we do? Why, nothing. She'd have no difficulty in following up her suspicions. Suspicions! You should have seen how she looked at me! He buries his head in his hands. There is silence for a time. Then she rises slowly and goes and sits beside him. Aubrey! Yes? I'm very sorry. Without meeting her eyes, he lays his hand on her arm for a moment. Well, we must look things straight in the face. Glancing round. At any rate, 
we've done with this. I suppose so. After a brief pause. Of course, she and I can't live under the same roof any more. You know, she kissed me tonight, of her own accord. I asked her to alter towards you. That was it, then. I... I'm sorry I sent her away. It was my fault. I made it necessary. Perhaps now she'll propose to return to the convent. Well, she must. Would you like to keep her with you and... and leave me? Paula! You needn't be afraid I'd go back to... what I was. I couldn't. Shh, for God's sake. We, you and I, we'll get out of this place. What a fool I was to come here again. You lived here with your first wife. We'll get out of this place and go abroad again, and begin afresh. Begin afresh? There's no reason why the future shouldn't be happy for us. No reason that I can see. Aubrey. Yes? You'll never forget this, you know. This? Tonight, and everything that's led up to it. Our coming here, Aline, our quarrels, cat and dog. Mrs. Cortelion, the Orades, this man. What an everlasting nightmare for you. Oh, we can forget it if we choose. That was always your cry. How can one do it? We'll make our calculations solely for the future. Talk about the future. Think about the future. I believe the future is only the past again, entered through another gate. That's an awful belief. Tonight proves it. You must see now that, do what we will, go where we will, you'll be continually reminded of what I was. I see it. You're frightened tonight. Meeting this man has frightened you. But that sort of thing isn't likely to recur. The world isn't quite so small as all that. Isn't it? The only great distances it contains are those we carry within ourselves. The distances that separate husbands and wives, for instance. And so it'll be with us. You'll do your best, I know that. You're a good fellow. But circumstances will be too strong for you in the end. Mark my words. Paula! Of course I'm pretty now. I'm pretty still. And a pretty woman, whatever else she may be, is always, well, endurable. But even now I notice that the lines of my face are getting deeper. So are the hollows about my eyes. Yes, my face is covered with little shadows that used to be there. Oh, I know I'm going off. I hate paint and dye and those messes, but by and by I shall drift the way of the others. I shan't be able to help myself. And then, some day, perhaps very suddenly, under a queer, fantastic light at night or... In the glare of morning, that horrid, irresistible truth that physical repulsion forces on men and women will come to you, and you'll sicken at me. I... You'll see me then, at last, with other people's eyes. You'll see me just as your daughter does now, as all wholesome folks see women like me. And I shall have no weapon to fight with, not one serviceable little bit of prettiness left me to defend myself with. A worn-out creature. Broken up, very likely. Sometime before I ought to be. My hair bright. My eyes dull. My body too thin or too stout. My cheeks rattled and ruddled. A ghost. A wreck. A caricature. A candle that gutters. Call such an end what you like. Oh, Aubrey, what shall I be able to say to you then? And this is the future that you talk about. I know it. I know it. He is still sitting, staring forward. She rocks herself to and fro, as if in pain. Oh, Aubrey! Oh. Paula! Trying to comfort her. Oh, and I wanted so much to sleep tonight. Laying her head upon his shoulder. From the distance, in the garden, there comes the sound of Drummle's voice, he is singing as he approaches the house. That's Cayley coming back from the Warren. Starting up. He doesn't know, evidently. I... I won't see him. She goes out quickly. Drummle's voice comes nearer. 
Aubrey rouses himself and snatches up a book from the table, making a pretense of reading. After a moment or two, Drummle appears at the window and looks in. Da -da -da -da. Ah, ha, my dear chap. Cayley. Drummle, coming into the room. I went down to the warren after you. Yes. Missed you. Well, I've been gossiping with Mrs. Cortellion. Confound you. I have heard the news. What have you heard? What have I heard? Why, Aline and young Ardale. Looking at Aubrey keenly. My dear Aubrey, Alice is under the impression that you are inclined to look on the affair favourably. Aubrey, rising and advancing to Drummle. You've not met Captain Ardale? No. Why do you ask? By the by, I don't know that I need tell you, but it's rather strange. He's not at the Warren tonight. No? He left the house half an hour ago to stroll about the lanes. Just now a note came from him, a scribble in pencil, simply telling Alice that she would receive a letter from him tomorrow. What's the matter? There's nothing very wrong, is there? My dear chap, pray forgive me if I'm asking too much. Cayley, you... You urged me to send her away. Aline, yes, yes. But, but by all accounts, this is quite an eligible young fellow. Alice has been giving me the history. Curse him! Hurling his book to the floor. Curse him! Yes, I do curse him. Him and his class. Perhaps I curse myself, too, in doing it. He has only led a man's life. Just as I, how many of us have done. The misery he has brought on me and mine. It's likely enough we, in our time, have helped to bring on others by this leading a man's life. But I do curse him for all that. My God, I've nothing more to fear. I've paid my fine. And so I can curse him in safety. Curse him! Curse him! In heaven's name, tell me what's happened. Aubrey, gripping Drummle's arm. Paula! Paula! What? They met tonight, here. They... They... They're not strangers to each other. Aubrey! Curse him! My poor wretched wife! My poor wretched wife! The door opens and Aline appears. The two men turn to her. There is a moment's silence. Father! Father! Aline? I... I want you. He goes to her. Father, go to Paula. He looks into her face, startled. Quickly, quickly! He passes her to go out. She seizes his arm with a cry. No, no, don't go! He shakes her off and goes. Aline staggers back towards Drummle. Drummle to Aline. What do you mean? What do you mean? I... I went to her room to tell her I was sorry for something I'd said to her. And I was sorry. I was sorry. I heard the fall. I... I've seen her. It's horrible. She... she has... Killed herself? Yes, yes. So everybody will say. But I know. I helped to kill her. If I had only been merciful. She faints upon the ottoman. He pauses for a moment irresolutely. Then he goes to the door, opens it, and stands looking out. End of the fourth act. End of The Second Mrs. Tanqueray by Arthur Wing Pinero.